but uh, in the meantime, let me go ahead and uh, welcome you back to uh, the afternoon portion of Compressing the Stack. And I uh, have the pleasure of um, introducing Alan Percy here, um, here to talk to us along with uh, Sergio Lopez, their title, uh, sorry, their sessions titled um, Managing Network Traffic from the Edge. Uh, so Alan, uh, won't take any more of your time, turn right, it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, so, okay. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon. We um, uh, we're pleased to be here. Uh, as I noted, uh, um, or that was noted by the introduction, I'm Alan Percy. I'm the senior director of product marketing. We're a um, uh, highly focused uh, hardware and software developer for the telecommunications space. Um, this is the first time Telco Bridges has been at the event. It's the third time I've been to the event, uh, and I joined the company this last December. And pleased to. Uh, to share with you uh, a strategy and a story we call the Intelligent Edge, and a, a few case studies, including uh, a story from uh, Sergio, who will uh, be presenting, like I said, the second half of the session. So um, let's get started. So a few things are starting to happen in the industry. I think if you've been paying attention, there's a, a couple of important uh, new initiatives that have happened over the last 18 months or so. One of them is from AT&T. They offer a new solution they call AT&T Flexware. And they market it as an offering where they take all the separate network functions that used to sit in the closet. Remember, there used to be you know, a modem or, or an optical network uh, termination device, then maybe a router, and then maybe other uh, uh, switches and other elements that would all be stacked in the wiring closet. And they've compressed that into a single device and deliver it to customers with the possibility of applications in the market, and they market it uh, at that, uh, is under AT&T Flexware. Verizon has done something very similar, a uh, very similar story, uh, very, um, very similar offer, uh, but based on uh, Verizon's enterprise and targeted towards Mark Verizon's enterprise customers, bringing you know, many of the th elements that used to make up network uh, termination uh, to the customer's uh, premise and this creates what we call the intelligent edge. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is the intelligent edge? How does it work? We're going to spend a few minutes digging into how it works and what can you do with it. And that's uh, where Sergio is going to help us talk about what they're doing with uh, the intelligent edge. So first of all, there are, I think we all uh, in this uh, audience are probably firsthand aware of some of the challenges that communications uh, service providers really face. One of the... More recent challenges, of course, is agility, right? And competing with the over-the-top players. Or if you're an over-the-top player, you're trying to figure out how do I compete against the uh, service providers. But those over-the-top services that, you know, that folks go to uh, for uh, applications, conferencing, for example, IPPBX functions, et cetera, et cetera, those are core services that, that the service providers would like to deliver to you and, of course, make a big difference in the, in the cost effectiveness. Also, there's network security. Certainly, no service provider wants to have their network be hacked. It's an important uh, level of awareness. Uh, currently, they're doing much of that in the core of their network, and we'll talk about uh, maybe there's a better way to do that. Reliability and scalability, certainly uh, no one wants to have their network go down, uh, and you want to be able to quickly and dynamically add scale to a network to improve it. Managing network traffic, and as what Sergio will talk about, is some problems uh, that are happening in his market with relative to to, uh, to uh, the traffic that they're facing uh, on a uh, weekly basis. And of course, uh, reduction of uh, the CPE SKUs. I think one of the sessions earlier this week, they talked about you know reducing the number of part numbers that service providers need to have on their shelves and be able to keep in their trucks and to be able to deliver to customers, to minimize that number uh, at, if at all possible. Uh, to, um, of course, reduce the inventory and reduce the uh, logistics involved. And then last but not least, of course, is the cost of truck rolls, right? If you go to a customer site, you want to do it once, 
uh, and if not even zero with a, a self-install. So these are some real uh, big challenges for service providers. And the photo on the right is a is a, a telephone pole in the corner of, uh, of the street in uh, Quito, Ecuador. I was there on vacation a little while ago, and it just, to me, says a little bit about a lot of the problems that the communications world has, sometimes outside North America. Um, but um, what happens is things just sort of happen. You keep you know, strapping more and more onto the network, and before you know it, this is the kind of mess that you end up with. So I want to step back for a moment and just kind of clarify some terminology. One of them is, is the term I like to call the dumb edge. This is the edge we all have grown up with. And there's you know, just a little bit of gray hair in the audience here to know about these, uh, these uh, d dumb edge devices. Basically, the customer access panels at almost every uh, enterprise, almost every residential uh, has some kind of customer access panel where the service is terminated and delivered. And this not only just put, provides a place to connect wires together, but it's an important business point, too, where it's the point of demarcation. This is the end of the responsibility for the service provider. And in general, they, they'll take the commitment to make sure that the service works to the point of demarcation, and after that point, uh, it's the customer's problem or the, cust or the integrator or somebody else's problem. But this is uh, very important, uh, not necessarily from a technical standpoint, but more from a business standpoint. Where is the end of my responsibility in, it, in your responsibility picks up? And of course, this kind of little device here has no intelligence whatsoever. It's just, a, it's just a place to terminate wires. Moving up on the IQ scale uh, becomes the smart, we call it the smart edge. And this is the smart jack. How many of you folks worked with smart jacks? Anyone work with them in the past? OK, a couple hands. The smart jack was uh, a somewhat intelligent, a little bit more intelligence. It was um, used to terminate uh, T1s and E1s. Uh, any kind of a data circuit or a, uh, maybe a high-density voice circuit uh, that gave remote access or remote loopback capability. So if a service provider were to put one of these in your closet and there were a problem with your phone service, they could initiate a loopback remotely, um, do some you know, bit air testing on the circuit to see if there's, for example, water has gotten into the trunking lines, these kinds of things. But they are very fixed function devices firmware based they uh, have you know obviously need to be installed but there's no way to upgrade these things the only way you upgrade them is you replace them they're just basic firmware based little black boxes uh, and there's no way to add any capabilities or expertise to it well um, that obviously was fine for some applications but it moves up a little bit to what we call the smarter edge and this is a, a relatively recent innovation, the, the uh, multi-service router. And now this is a black box that um, a lot of the vendors have come together maybe in the last seven or eight years, uh, which combined many of the functions of the network termination, plus we're putting a router and a switch and maybe some Wi-Fi functionality, or maybe even a small SIP proxy, these kinds of intelligence in these little black boxes. But again, they were closed boxes. They were not standards-based. Um, they were purpose-built devices, uh, had very fixed function. This brings us now to today, what we're calling the Intelligent Edge Platform. And what this is, a, a new category. Uh, it not only terminates the network uh, um, physical interfaces, but it provides a very flexible, uh, virtualized network function uh, potential where we can implement all these other services, routing, firewall, SD-WAN, maybe even session border controller, proxy, and potentially even applications out of the customer prem. So it gives almost like a blank canvas to the service provider that once installed gives the opportunity to load various software versions, to remotely update the software, and to manipulate those uh, functions uh, without having to do a truck roll, and it simplifies the number of, of SKUs that they, uh, that they deploy. What's the core? Uh, what's some of the basic technology to make this happen? Well, I think if you folks have been here for uh, the last couple of years, you know about the network function virtualization framework that Etsy put together, that this um, provides uh, three basic layers. The first is the infrastructure, the network function virtualization infrastructure, which is uh, essentially a virtualized CPU platform. Then these virtualized network functions, and I know it's a bit of a mouthful because it's all the same letters, 
but the VNFs are software elements that can be dynamically loaded into these devices to provide those services. So the example here uh, is NAT, maybe a firewall, maybe router functionality. All, uh, these VNFs are these building blocks of these enhanced services. And the last, of course, is the network management, and that uh, is orchestration, controlling what software gets started, controlling uh, and capturing errors, uh, potentially um, reloading software for uh, version updates, those kinds of functions. So what do the analysts and what's the market think about this new, uh, this new approach and new structure? Will, will the uh, IDC um, um, has been tracking this very closely, uh, and they give us this quote here, the telecom virtualized network functions of a VNF market, they expect to grow to 16 billion by 2022 with a compound annual growth of 45 percent. So there's tremendous opportunity in software that can be delivered and installed on the edge of the network. And the question is sort of is why and what are the use cases people are using them for? Well, we're seeing all kinds of examples of VNF start to come out of the market. From application delivery controllers, essentially load balancers, we're seeing media servers to manage, for example, voice and video conferencing and Matter of fact, uh, the doctor's presentation previously talked about latency, and this is an example of by putting a media server and putting some intelligence at the edge of the net network, you can reduce the latency because uh, it doesn't have to go to the core of the network for processing. Uh, session border controller for security, maybe routing, SD-WAN, firewall, a lot of those other functions now are starting to uh, appear in the marketplace as VNF software modules uh, to uh, facilitate uh, these uh, network advanced network uh, functions. So one thing that comes up often is sort of the, the core versus edge debate. This is, this is uh, I think, been an ongoing debate for, since the invention of the, of the cloud. Right? So if I put everything in the cloud, then I, don't, I can put the dumbest possible thing at the edge of the network. Well, conversely, there's reasons why I would want to put something at the edge of the network. And, and one of these arguments um, probably the best way to, um, to give you a representation of it is the device that's in virtually every one of your pockets, which is the smartphone. Why do we have so much intelligence in the smartphone? Why don't they just put all the intelligence in the core of the network? You know, the original telephone network, the telephone itself was the dumbest, least cost, costly piece of the, el of the network element, and they put all the smarts in the core. And this is, what, 50 years ago they did this. Why all of a sudden do we need a whole computer in our pocket? Well, latency, survivability, we want to be able to use features on our, our mobile device. We want to add new applications. We want to be able to use mapping when we don't have 4G networks uh, at, our, at our disposal. You go hiking, you like to have a map and a compass in your pocket, even though there's no network connectivity. So there are times when putting functions out at the edge of the network makes the most sense. There are times when it makes the most sense to put those functions on the core by delivering platforms that give that flexibility to the marketplace that allows those to, uh, to shift those uh, functions from one to the other. So some uh, use cases that, that we think are um, particularly interesting, especially for this audience. One of them is, is you know, the micro and pico cells. And this was uh, d discussed a little bit earlier today. Uh, you know, there were many applications where it makes sense to put a small cell uh, in a local location. So either residential applications, for example, an apartment building, maybe a retail at a mall where you uh, would need to have some, uh, you know, have some cellular coverage inside, uh, you know, a, a long stretch of a, a mall that has a metal roof. Uh, public spaces like confer conference, uh, I'm sorry, like um, big convention centers or uh, maybe a football stadium where there would be a high density of people. You need numerous cells large venues, but they're putting, they're using this VNF technology to put the intelligence of the cell in these small packages and put them on a pole uh, out in uh, remote locations. Another area that's kind of interesting is these neighborhood content delivery boxes. And, uh, and again, this was discussed a little bit earlier today. And this is where they want to be able to put media content out near the consumers of the media content. And a perfect example is, you know, Netflix drops all of a sudden, you know, season five of, uh, let's see, Narcos, right? Um, those fans almost immediately on that day all want to watch those movies. If you concentrated all that traffic into the core 
of, of a network, it would just completely overload and trash the network. But if you can, as a cable operator or as an operator, if you can put a, an image of that out into a neighborhood, into a curb box at the end of a neighborhood, and deliver that media content, kind of like a local cache, what happens then is it pushes that traffic just to the neighborhood. Instead of it going all the way to the core of the network, uh, it pushes it out to the edge. And this is um, w one of the uh, you know, anticipated applications for this, uh, for both um, you know, cable and fiber to the home. Point of sale, this is another area that we're starting to see uh, intelligent edges. So you um, remember you used to be, you did the card swipe and then there was an actual an analog modem and it would connect to the card provider to validate the card. Well, of course they moved to an IP-based network and that all makes sense, but s retail stores don't want to have to wait for that transaction time and they also want to be able to continue to take transactions when uh, there might be an interruption or an overload of the wide area network. So they are looking now to applications like credit authorization being pushed to the edge of the network. So the card swipe does a quick database lookup, sees whether or not the card's valid, posts a transaction locally, and the next time the IP network's available, it trans transfers the uh, transaction securely to an encrypted connection uh, to, the, uh, to the bank. Again, another excellent example of a, a place where uh, the intelligence at the edge can help. And one that's a little bit closer to our situation here is these virtual business gateways. And we talked a little bit before about these multi-service gateways, but these virtual business gateways now start to combine routing, switching, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, SD-WAN functionality, along potentially with delivering application services uh, with traffic management and quality monitoring into the box that goes at the enterprise. So now the enterprise is a large contact center, or to a large uh, a traditional business user has some intelligence in, the, in a single device in their wiring closet to give them the smarts to be able to process telephone calls if there may be an outage in the network uh, and or to do it very efficiently without a whole stack of separate boxes. So that's where I wanted to transition uh, the presentation over to uh, Sergio. Uh, I want to just obviously first uh, um, introduce Sergio. Um, he uh, is uh, the engineering manager at, engineering manager at Makatel, uh, and he's responsible for the network uh, at Makatel. And uh, Sergio, why don't you um, you take it from here? Let's just make sure everybody can hear you first. Yep. Yeah. So maybe audio. We get. Uh, oh, I think you're muted there, Sergio. Yeah. Sorry, I was. There I we was go. Mute. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. They're all saying, uh, waving back. All right. All right. All right, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, and you just let me know when you want to advance the slide. Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Okay. So we're on the About Marketel slide. Yeah, Marketel is a ISP, I mean, a communication service provider within Mexico. Uh, we were founded in 1994 in Monterrey. And we have a, a extension of on, on over 100 countries uh, with uh, high bandwidth by, uh, links. And within Mexico, we have 4,600 km, kilometers of fiber. We offer cloud, internet, and, and zip trunking. Uh, historically, Marcatel uh, was uh, used to manage traffic from the wholesale in the U.S. to Mexico. But now um, Marketel is changing the uh, profile of their customers to, to target uh, contact centers, uh, which manage a lot of traffic. So please uh, move the slide, Alan. No. So one of the problems we face when, when we uh, started to, uh, to manage these kind of customers is that the uh, call centers uh, were also in the path of uh, modernizing their networks and they discovered or they started using uh, automatic dialers. The automatic dialer uh, causes a lot of problem when it's not well configured because uh, in, in one single second can uh, flood the, the entire network with over 1,000 uh, zipping bytes which the network is not fully prepared. 
So uh, we started to understand the problem whenever we face this situation because not, it is not only the, the one customers that starts sending a lot of uh, invites to, to the core uh, SVC, but the other customers uh, also starts, uh, once they uh, see rejections, I mean, by the core SVC to the uh, trouble uh, customers, uh, there are less resources, less resources for the rest of the customers. So it is like a, a snowball. The, the rest of the customers also also get a, a rejection and, and, and they retry. So these all retries provoke a congestion in the network and eventually crashing the, crashing the whole box. So uh, we understood that we needed to move the intelligence to the edge because no matter how big we can grow the core SVC, the central, uh, the central platforms, eventually the, the customers will again could, uh, float, could, could overflow the system and crash it. So please, uh, um, uh, Alan, go ahead to, with the presentation. So we need, we understood that we needed to uh, to find a good solution uh, to install in the customer premises with the with a call rate limiting, because in that way uh, we would be able to control the flow of traffic that the that the customer is sending. If the customer uh, uh, is overflowing the the rate that we are programming. Uh, he will be the only affected. No, he he will he will not impact the rest of the customers. So uh, this gives us also the opportunity to manage better the traffic from the call centers. Uh, besides giving them protection for a DOS, we also are able to to route their calls to different locations with the intelligence in the in the edge because in that way can uh, can route to different uh, paths to different uh, cities which process the, the the calls in a in a um, one by one uh, attempt uh, so this solution also has give us the opportunity to make a substitution in the anis and and even to implement routines for uh, call centers, which are a uh, rotation ANIS, which they use it very much for uh, calling their customers. So uh, I think uh, we can see in the, in the next slide, Alan, please. Yep. Okay. The scenario that we were talking, that we are talking about. So this is the, uh, as we can see, we have the, the customer premises, uh, which in the worst case can handle up to 3,000 uh, zip invites when not properly configured, which happens many times because not all the administrators of the call centers have a very good knowledge of, of how to, how to uh, contain these, uh, these machines. So the, the right solution for us was to put the free SVC from Telco Bridges which give us the possibility to install it in a bare metal server, or even uh, we, we can use it within our own network with uh, Siena devices. We have uh, tested the interoperability between Siena, which is our demarcation uh, point, and the, and the free SBC from Telco Bridges, and they, they work very well. So in this sense, uh, we can see that uh, we, we receive a lot of invites and invites which could be 1,000 if you wish, but the free SBC will only let a specific amount of uh, invites, let's say it's the 10% of, what, of, of, of whatever they are uh, sending. In this way, the, the attempts or, this, or the invites go uh, flow uh, smoothly to, within the network, and within the network we manage to to send this call to the to our IP connections with the other carriers or our all TDM connections. This is where the the routing, the main routing happens in the core SBC. But in that way, we can let this SBC to
to do uh, their main role, which is routing routing calls and not uh, not overloading uh, the processor, re rejecting invites that cannot uh, handle. And this is a, a very good solution we found and it's working very well. We plan to, to do it massively uh, in, all, in all our customers because we found it's a, I mean, there are many other SBCs uh, in the market, a lot of SBCs, but uh, uh, mainly they are expensive. So this is a very good solution because it's cheap and it runs, it, it runs very well on any, any metal that doesn't have to be proprietary. Right, right, well thank you. So um, just a, a quick recap. Uh, so what um, Sergio's diagramming here is you know, a large contact center with a high speed dialer on the left hand side generates an overload of traffic, uh, potentially tries to overload the network w with traffic beyond the, the uh, agreed to SLA. Uh, and they use an SBC at the edge of the network to then trim that traffic. And they trim it with an intelligent algorithm so that it doesn't just reject a call. If a call, you know, if, if they, let's say, agree to 1,000 calls per second and they get 1,001, it doesn't just reject it. It actually slows the responses down, to, sort of like the entry lane uh, of LA freeways, right? It just meters the traffic into the network to keep it within the SLA. And then the traffic, when it arrives at the core of the network, is within the SLA so they can manage that traffic more intelligently, uh, again, at the edge. In addition to that, too, the other benefits were he now is able to keep these potential denial of service attacks uh, at bay at the edge of the network. And he also um, f later found, discovered uh, a unique technique that allowed him to manipulate the uh, caller ID and ANI on a per campaign basis at the edge of the network. So a um, contact center, if they had a particular campaign, could change the ANI to a specific message for that campaign, uh, which of course comes in really handy. Uh, it is a value add for the customer uh, at the end. So in a nutshell, that's what, um, what Makatel's been, been doing, uh, putting this intelligence at the edge uh, to provide that. So any, any questions for Sergio before we move on? I get a lot of nodding heads, I think they get it. They understand exactly. Good. Okay. Well, we'll move on then. All right. Thank you, Sergio. So yeah, no problem. Yep. So um, just a quick summary: some of the benefits. Uh, if Sergio, you want to go through this real quick. Yeah, sure. I mean, the uh, a summary is that uh, we can better fulfill the SLA we have with customers within uh, considering the uh, the completion rate the, the demand we can intellig intelligently uh, manage their their calls and what else yeah we have a visibility of the of the quality of their of their calls because we have a, a an edge device and we also can make his uh, modifications in the ANIs in order to to mask uh, the the numbers that uh, has been used for uh, marketing purposes uh, on demand of the call center. And of course, we have uh, avoided expensive upgrades in the core network because every every step to move uh, forward in capacity cost a lot of money in the in the core and it's not very reliable because it, it is it is still uh, on risk mm, so uh, we have a uh, flexible scaling to fit a customer growth because in the same server we can uh, be growing uh, per session uh, depending on the amount of traffic the, the, the customers want to send and we are not limited anymore by devices. Yep. That's awesome. All right. That's it. Thank That's you very it. much. Appreciate your uh, um, presenting with us today. So, yeah, um, yep. I wanted to close out that, uh, with a couple of um, where to go more, where to learn more. Um, a couple of things I found a really useful uh, report. There's um, from uh, SDX Central. There's a report if you search Google for 2018 state of the VNF market. 
Uh, it's a great, really in-depth paper that um, describes uh, what's happening with VNFs from a market standpoint and some of the really interesting applications. Uh, and if you're interested more about this free SBC offering that, uh, that Tucker Bridges came up with, of course, at freesbc.com. And my blog is um, at blog.telcobridges.com. And we've got a host of videos that explain uh, what, how some of this has been configured and how it's managed. So with that, I guess um, I'm going to open it up for any other just last-minute questions. No? OK. Well, I'll be available afterwards. Uh, be happy to answer your questions. And if need be, we can get Sergio on the line again uh, to um, answer a question. So thanks so much for, uh, for your time. Thanks.